Hey everyone, welcome to today's live stream. I hope that you're all well. Thanks for joining me here today. I'm sorry that it's been such a long time since we last did a live stream, but here we are. So this is quite an informal session, basically. I'm just asking you guys for um, questions, and I've already got a few that um, have been sent in ahead of this session. But as well as that, I'm actually going to be reviewing some students' videos that have been sent to me before this so if you support me on patreon then you have the opportunity for me to actually review videos of your playing so if you want to be part of that then all you have to do is uh, follow me on patreon here and you should be able to see that now um hopefully you guys can see and hear everything okay if not just let me know and um if you are watching then it'd be great to know when you where you're watching from so if you want to leave a comment let me know what country you're watching from it's always fun to find out um where you guys are all from and to do some shout outs so yeah if you want to um get your video review then you can do this um by joining me on patreon and i think this is going to be a regular service that i do i've had um some good fun reviewing some student submissions from uh stephen cobbin um for this post so thanks to both of you guys for uh, for sending those in so we're going to get straight to it. We're going to do that. Then I've got um, a few questions here. I've got a question from Big The Wig and a few people that I have, um, that have sent in questions as well. So the first student that we're going to listen to is, um, is we're going to start off with Steve. Um, Steve Johnson, who's a student uh, from Whitby, which is not too far from where I live. It's um, interesting. I have some students that end up signing up the lessons and they don't live that far away. So it's pretty cool occasionally. Um, when restrictions aren't too bad, we get to get together and jam and things like that. So anyway, um, let's hear this version of Summertime, which Steve has sent in. This is from a recent duo gig, um, which he did with a, a sax player. So hopefully you guys can see this. You should be able to hear the sound when I start playing. And you should also be able to hear me, although I'm not going to be doing too much talking. Um, initially, I'm just uh, going to sit here and watch. And maybe I'll pause the video if there's anything that I feel like I have to say. So um yeah, if you're watching, then uh, this is a really cool performance from Steve. So grab a cup of tea, grab a cup of coffee, and uh, let's enjoy some of Steve's playing. <laughs> Thank you. 
so I'm just going to pause it there. So good job, Steve. Thanks for sending this in. The first thing that I have to say about this is uh, the choice of shirts from you and the sax player. Fantastic. How can you not love a jazz performance when you guys are wearing such cool shirts? I really can't dislike anything about this performance from the get-go. So well done. I, I think that, um, that you've got a nice balance between the two instruments and um, you displayed some nice chords and you kept a secure sense of time throughout the uh, the theme you were playing the chords while the sax player was playing the theme so good job and generally your improvisation i liked how you quoted the melody um, in parts in your improvisation that was great and you were generally keeping track of most of the chord changes and you had some good rhythmic ideas um there which was whoops sorry guys that's not what you want is it when you do one of these things go away um yeah and you had some good rhythmic ideas during your improv so really good kind of um, start to this. So some things that I would have liked to have seen with this or some things that I could suggest for improvement. Well, it's the sax solo and um, I can see that you've got a loop pedal going. Now, um, there's nothing wrong with using a loop pedal and we've discussed this and I think that this is a good idea, but what would have been good would be to maybe either stop the loop pedal after your solo and go back to comping or maybe have the sax player take the first solo and have you comp for a little bit longer um, and then maybe just record one loop towards the end of the sax solo or something like that that you could then just play off for your own improvisation because um, obviously I've watched this just before this live stream and I think that you know from now onwards I mean you've got some kind of cool ideas and things like you know little kind of single line fills that you do behind the sax solo but I think it would be nice just to hear you um, comp by yourself for a little bit longer, uh, maybe do a few walking bass lines. some of the comping ideas a little bit more and then you could eventually just record one of those for yourself to improvise over um, but that's the only thing really because I think that um, what you've done kind of works where you've got one layer of comping and you're playing things but you know I think there's so much kind of um, development that you can have within this this setting right because uh, I used to play in a duo with another sax player actually who sometimes watches these videos um, so he was a really great player and there's so much that you can explore with this in regards to the comping. So a good duo record that I recommend you check out or anybody else um, check out who's interested is Jim Hall and Bob Brookmeyer. I think that's how you say his name, who's a trombone player. And they did um, some performing together. But one record that's brilliant is called Live at the North Sea Jazz Festival. And that gives you some really good ideas of arrangements that you could use for these type of scenarios. So yeah, in terms of the comping, that's what I would suggest there. Now, in regards to the actual solo itself, like I said, I think you had a solid foundation on this. What I would have liked would be, would have been to maybe hear you explore some different tonalities um, besides the tonic minor. So you were playing this in the key of A minor, which is cool. It's one of the common keys for summertime. And you were playing... loads of things from A minor which is cool um, but I think that beyond that it would have also been nice to hear you maybe play off that um, different tonalities so in the key of A minor you can always play off the relative major and if you play for example a C major 7 over an A bass note that gives you a wonderful upper extended chord there so you've got against an A bass note you've got the third the fifth, the seventh, and the ninth. So if you just hear the sound of that over A minor, I've got an A minor loop programmed here. I think that's a good way of creating a little bit of harmonic variety. So you can go from A minor ideas to 
C major. And I think that's a refreshing contrast that you can um, use alongside some of the A minor ideas. So they are the only things that I would say there. But overall, this is a really good performance from a first gig. And I look forward to seeing where you can take this um, this sax duo. I think that you're, um, yeah, it is exciting to see. So thanks, Steve. That's our first uh, submission here. And we're going to review uh, Cole's submission in just a second here. So um, let's see if we've got any more comments or anything like that um, okay cool so we're still um good here keeping good time so i'm now going to review cole's um submission and this is um, a submission that he's done over freddy the freeloader um so let's have a listen to this i'll start this from the beginning Okay, I'm just going to pause it there, Cole, um, just before I forget what I've got to say. So good work on this. It looks like you've learned this as a full song, which is really assuring. It's um, always good to make sure you memorise the chords, the theme, and have a little bit of a solo planned out for these things. So you've obviously done that there. And there's some really good positive aspects to this. So this is Freddy the Freeloader. Um, I think it was by Miles Davis, um, if, if anybody doesn't know that. But... Yeah, I liked how you used to deliver in the melody. I think that maybe you could lay back on that um, a little bit more. The arrangement that you have would almost work better, um, I think, as a solo guitar thing, maybe, than kind of a full band thing. So, for example, that melody line, you might even want to just play that. Sixes, and that might give you a bit more kind of swing and articulation in how you deliver the melody rather than just feeling like you've got to be kind of restricted to these chords all the time. So I think that might be um, a worthwhile thing to experiment with. So that's one thing in regards to the melody. Now with the company itself, I liked that you were using these 13 voicings and these kind of dominant seven voicings and you were playing quite syncopated and you've got a nice finger style technique, which is good. Um, what I would suggest, because you went round that chorus a couple of times, you're pretty much doing similar things, which is cool, right? You know, if you're just comping for someone else and it's a duo, you don't want to make things too complex. But because you presented this over a backing track, I would have liked to hear some more chord inversions. So for B flat, 13s are good, 9s are good. You can find these in other positions 
on the guitar fingerboard. And you can even do things like think of F minor rather. Other B flat, if you listen to um, Wes Montgomery playing chords on West Coast Blues, that's a jazz blues in B flat, but he uses lots of uh, companion minor chords, which is a really cool concept to get more inversions. So I'd have liked to see you utilize more of the fingerboard in that respect, but this is the first video I've ever seen so of you playing, even though we've um, exchanged quite a few messages and comments here before. So I don't really know that much where you're coming from, but certainly that would be my feedback. We'll be to try and learn some of these other chords in different positions of the guitar fingerboard. So that's what I would suggest there. So I'll have to really kind of try and deal with this the next time. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just listen to some of your improvisation as well, because I know that some of this um, included some improv. So let's uh, share your work on the improv um, so that everybody can hear it. <laughs> to playing the theme. So uh, good work here, Cole. This is, um, this is like I said, this is the first time I've heard you play. So it's good to hear that you're kind of learning things and kind of persevering with your jazz journey uh, and, and kind of getting some um, licks and stuff together. So I liked, in regards to the improv, I liked how you um, got all the chord changes, right? There's lots of arpeggios. So you obviously have these underneath your fingers and you know where all the main chord tones for each of the chords lie, which is a really useful step. I also liked how you added some chromatic notes as well, especially towards the beginning of the solo. There was lots of chromatic notes in between the arpeggios. So that's really cool. Um, I think that sometimes, the, the only feedback I would say here is that sometimes there's too literal of an arpeggio chord approach going on, especially at the end of that, the last four bars, when you went to F7 and E flat seven. Um, there, you know, it sounded very much like, okay, here's this chord and there's here's this arpeggio, which, you know, yeah, you've got to get the chord changes, but the good thing about a blues is you don't always have to do that. So um, I, I think that of that, you might want to just take some liberties over the last kind of couple of chords of a jazz blues. If I just record a loop with those on. You could just play like B flat blues, like tonic blue stuff. So you don't always have to think about the chord changes. In fact, sometimes it can be exhausting to always do that. And whenever you listen to really great jazz musicians, that's something that they're really good at doing is going between um, playing over the chord changes and then sometimes having a more kind of flexible approach where they're just thinking of blues ideas and stuff. So that's what you want to do there. I'd also suggest maybe working on your swing feel a little bit. Um, you've got a really nice finger style technique, but I think maybe the accents and dynamics are things that you might want to consider working on also. A fantastic solo over this is Winton Kelly's piano solo. It's a very accessible solo to start with. So if you haven't transcribed anything before and that process seems overwhelming, then that's not a bad one to try and learn by ear. It's not too difficult, um, at least to learn a chorus or two. But if you do that, then you're really going to pick up his articulation and feel and dynamics and these things that I'm talking about. And they're hopefully going to have a knock on effect into your own playing. So I suggest learning maybe one or two choruses of uh, Winton Kelly's solo. If you're new to transcribing and you really find that difficult and you give it a good go and you find that too challenging, then 
um, what I'll do is I'll send you a video. There's a resource I found where someone's transcribed the solo and I can send that resource for you to, to check out. It seems like an accurate transcription, but only use that as a kind of uh, secondary measure, um, if you will. I think it'd be a much better idea to have a go at improvising, um, by, sorry, at transcribing yourself first before using a transcription. Um, and then obviously having done that, maybe play along with one or two choruses, try and analyze what he's doing. If you can break down the lines and see why they work, then that's a really valuable process. And the third thing would be to try and compose your own solo in the style of Winton Kelly, because then you're not just copying him note for note, you're starting to try and um, you know, use some of the things that you do. So that's definitely a solo that I'd recommend you check out. Whenever you learn, for anybody that's watching, whenever you learn a jazz standard, um, it's always a good idea to try and learn at least a bit of somebody else's solo, a few bars, or even just listen to a few versions so you know what's going on. So yeah, thanks again for the submission call. Obviously, if you've got any questions about any of that, then um, feel free to let me know. So I've got a backlog of kind of comments and questions to get through. So I'm going to start with the oldest and then work into the newer comments. So yeah, for anybody that's just joining in, uh, drop me a comment, let me know where you're watching from. Um, and if you've got any questions, this is kind of like an open house session here, so I'm, I haven't got too much of a format, really. Uh, for those of you, you guys always ask me about the guitar, which I play. So this is um, a good in Fifth Avenue, which I really, I need to sell this. So <laughs> if anybody um, in Leeds or around the Leeds kind of uh, West Yorkshire area needs a jazz guitar, you could do much worse than this. I'm, I'm just getting too many. Um, so if you're interested, let me know. I'm looking at... 500 pounds uh, for this, 500 pounds, which is not that bad, is it, for a beginner jazz guitar? So, yeah, a little bit of a sales plug there. So, answering some of your guys' questions that you've sent in. Let's see, I, I asked this, this five stream is well overdue. I, I asked for questions. I'll go into the um, community tab here on my YouTube thing. This was three months ago, so a little bit behind. So, when I asked some of you guys what you wanted me to talk about, um, let's see what some of you said. Eric said, modes, major scales, harmonic minor, melodic minor. Yeah, um, I need to do more lessons about those. I've got a lesson called Beginner Jazz Scales, which um, gets you started with some of those, but those are kind of massive topics to kind of um, talk about here. The only thing I would say is, you know, to begin with, those are really good scales to learn if you need to jazz, if you don't know them, learn them with a sixth string and fifth string route to begin with and they're definitely well worth learning if you don't know what they are. Um, modes themselves are useful, obviously, in modal songs like So What or Impressions, they're really useful there, but generally, depending on what level you're at, chord tones are the better thing to focus on, uh, and then looking into modes later is usually a better option. So, someone else asked, how to make money as a jazz guitarist? <laughs> well, I already answered that one there, so retrain. <laughs> in terms of playing jazz, it's... If you're playing live, it's quite um, a challenging profession to, to, to make a lot of money um, in. So, Williams asked, how to create and use free note chords that are movable up and down the neck, then apply them to songs? How to create and use free note chords that are movable up and down the neck? Um, well, what I would say there is I did a really old lesson, which you should check out um, if you haven't already, about um, shell voicings. <laughs> And that's what I would say there. So three note chords, you could take, for example, a major seven chord. You've got root, seven, and three. And then you can amend that to minor seven. Um, and you can make it dominant seven. So those are great kind of three note chord voicings to begin learning. And you can play them in different keys. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking there. Uh, you can do the same thing just while I'm on that subject. There's a three note chord there. If you invert these two notes further up the neck, here we've got root seven three in the key of G. Play this further up, I can have root three seven. And they're great kind of chords to, to learn if you want to comp kind of basically over something like autumn leaves or whatever. Those chord voicings are never gonna go out of fashion. You know, the lowest work. So th that's what I recommend there. Um, beyond that, if you are a little bit more advanced, then you might wanna start to look into inversions and walking up chords.
things like that. And I've got a lesson coming out on Monday, which kind of uh, talks a little bit more about that. So I won't go so too, too much more in depth about that right now. So let's see what other questions we've got. Um, time, feel, pocket and swing. That's a really good one. And that could easily be one that I talk for an hour on. But time, feel, pocket and swing. Well, I think going back to the advice that I gave Cole earlier, I think that transcribing is a really good way to work on your time feel. Um, unless you play along with a solo, you're never really going to get the full idea of what it means to be like playing on top of the beat, be right on the beat, behind the beat. If you play along with people that do that, then you'll soon figure out what that means. You know, For example, if you play along and you like someone like Dexter Gordon, he always plays very much on top of the beat. So listening and transcribing and playing along with him is a good idea to work on time feel. Of course, beyond that, in terms of some more kind of uh, solitary exercises, I'm a big advocate of using the metronome. So if you just get a metronome and set it to beats two and four, I think that's a really good revealing way to work on your time because if you do backing tracks and things like that, it can often be like putting a blanket over... Um, over some of your time issues, you know. Whereas if it's just you by yourself or you with a metronome, then you can't rely on hearing where you are. Um, you can't rely on a drummer giving you an indication. You've got to be completely self-sufficient. So I would say using a metronome, um, I should probably do a full lesson about that at some point because I don't think I've got anything. But um, yeah, it's kind of a general rule of practice adopted by jazz musicians is to sometimes use a metronome on beats two and four um, to help kind of develop the jazz time feel. So that's that question dealt with. So let's go back onto the chat and see. There's a few more people chiming in. So we'll see um, who we've got right here. And I'll just switch this camera angle right here. So Jazz Guitar has put, hey, how do I get started with chord melody? I can already put the melody on the top two strings and harmonize with the correct chord, but I have no idea how to mix lines and substitutions in. That's a really good question. Um, I would say it depends on whatever song you are working on. So you can assign a chord to a melody note, but you need to know how to mix lines and substitutions in. Well, a good thing that I like to do, a good kind of rule of thumb, is um, I think if, you, if you're playing something like All The Things You Are, um, this is a good example because it's got a point where um, there's literally nothing going on. So... I think that, you know, at that tune, maybe when you get to C major, that's a good point where you could add something there because that's like a solid part of the song where there's just time to add things. So one thing that you could do there, you could just add in chords from the harmonized C major scale, right? So there's C major, and I would just go in D minor, then E minor, using these kind of George Van Epps chords. So that's one cool thing that you can do. That's a bit of a simpler way there. I'm just using kind of drop two chords. There's a D minor, there's a D sharp diminished chord, then E minor. And the good thing about that substitution is um, when you come back to E minor, if you take that E minor seven chord and then you uh, put a C bass note on, that's pretty much, that. What they call that a secondary relative minor, don't they? So in the key of C, obviously, your standard relative minor is A minor, and then your secondary relative minor is E minor. So when you come back to E minor, it's not like you've gone really far. So that's one way in which you can do that. Um, so whenever you see a static point in a, chord, in a tune where the melody is still, then you could do that. Same thing, take, sit, maybe taking up a tune like Nuage by Django Reinhardt. <laughs> Same thing again, right? Just use, going up the harmonized major scale, it's G there for two bars, so I don't just want to stay on G. I can play things that are related to G, like the harmonized major scale. So that's one idea. And of course, you could do the same thing. You could just play a line there instead. So whether you use a line or whether you use chords, 
it's up to you, really. It's, it's up to you. I think that work on one thing and then ultimately have freedom to do whatever you want at your disposal. And that's one good thing that I really like about solo jazz guitar. You can kind of just, you know, roll with it, right? You, you can have like these set arrangements to begin with, but as you get more and more confident, you can work from them and you don't always have to feel like you're just kind of stuck to playing the same thing. And that's how I think most jazz musicians kind of work with a tune. They just have like an adaptable form that they can run with. They don't have um, like a set in stone kind of arrangement that they play all the time. So that's thanks for the question, Jazz Guitar. That was a really good question. So, <laughs> Mr. Dippy Dappy, thanks for the comment. What's the best way to learn and apply melodic minor interchanges? And then he's also asked, what's the best way to start learning to solo over turnarounds? The best way to learn and apply melodic minor into chord changes. Well, I think to begin with, um, for melodic minor, that's A melodic minor. You need to hear how all these notes work. So what I would do would be, um, I'll just clear this loop. I would just record an A minor chord. And I will play each of the notes just to hear the sound of the scale. So. And I would explore it like that. I would try and sing some of those notes against the root note. You could, if you don't have a loop pedal, you could play a tonic open string. And then you could just kind of play around a melodic minor like that. So you've got to try and hear that sound. I love the melodic minor sound. It's such a strong, beautiful sound um, to work with. That natural six, oh man, it's such a great sound, followed by the raised seventh. Probably one of my favourite scales to use over a, a tonic minor chord, so that's what I would do there. Um, a good example of the melodic minor in a song, one of the only examples that I can think of is basically the last part of uh, Autumn Leaves, that second time ending. Sorry, the first time ending. Like in the key of E, that's like E. C sharp, which is the six, and then the raised seven, coming back to E minor. That's a good example to check out if you need to get used to it. So hopefully that answers your question. And for you guys that are just uh, chiming in, then uh, feel free if you've got any questions just to um, drop them in or shout outs. Let me know where you're um, watching from. It's always good to know where you guys are checking out this stuff from. I was speaking to a good friend of mine, Pete, really good bass player. Pete, who uh, went to college, Leeds College of Music at the same time as what I did years and years ago. And um, he said, oh, you've got loads of uh, loads of uh, German jazz guitar players know who you are and watch your lessons. I was like, that's crazy. That's mental. Who would have thought? Because I, when we used to play together, I sucked. <laughs> um, but luckily I got better. So um, it's, it just blows my mind still um, years into doing this. So other questions. So, oh, Seb's joining in. Hey, Seb, how you doing, man? We'll have to grab a pint soon. Um, working just now, but look forward to catching up later. Cool, thanks. J.R. Goldman said, Hi, Jamie, you have helped me with some good stuff from California. Oh, thanks, J.R. That's really good to hear. And we've got Ozzy321, who's uh, watching from Deepest Surrey. That's cool. Um, and then J.R. has asked me, Please do a video of your favourite 251 major and minor. So I'm not sure what you mean by that, if you're talking about major or minor 251 licks or major or minor 251 chord progressions. Incidentally, if you are talking about licks, I've got a bunch of videos on the channel about major or minor 251 licks. So if you just type you know, my name on YouTube, um, I'll just show you, it's gonna take one second. So if you go on YouTube and then you type in uh, my name, then, 251 there's a bunch of licks and stuff that like I think those were major 251 licks right there and there's probably some more maybe some old ones as well 
from when I used to like jump on a massive. Um, so yeah, there, there's some stuff there to check out in regards to two five one licks. Um, going through the comments as well. What is the best way to know and practice chord scales? What's the best way to know and practice chord scales? That's a good question. I suppose it depends what you mean by um, chord scales. Chord scales. I mean, if you're talking about maybe like harmonized major scales, I'm not sure if you mean that, but what I think might be more interesting to talk about is um, whenever I, when I started to learn chords, you've got all these different systems, right? You've got like uh, drop two chords, root on six, root on five, extended chords, things like that. So what I used to like to do is I would just try and play scales maybe on the top four strings. So if you take a key like G, then you can play, and there's like a, a few different options for harmonizing a G chord. Next note in this scale is A. And I'll try and get this camera so it's facing you guys a little bit. So you could harmonize that. Like so, there's your third and seventh and you've got a 13 and a ninth. So there I've got um, a chord for my tonic, a chord with the second as I go to the third. That's a drop two chord. Because the only thing is when you learn things like drop two chords that are all good to do. You're still missing out some notes as well. So that's why learning things like extended chords fills in that gap, right? So you could go G, A, B, C is a bit of an interesting one. I'm not really a big fan of that sound of um, a major a major seventh with a fourth. I hate that sound. <laughs> uh, it's not really a good sound for jazz. What I find is a much better option is to have is to have a major seven sharp eleven. So right there, um, you could probably play something like this. This is a better chord to play there. Um, and this one, I'm running out of real estate without a cutaway, but that to me is a much better sound rather than having a fourth on a chord, which does nothing for me. And you can keep going up the scale like that, right? You, know, you can have a note there, which has got the 13th one. That's a G kind of six. Sorry, what chord is that? You could play, yeah, you could play that one for a, a G, which has got the, an E natural on top. And I would go up like so. So you've got scalic passages like that. And you can do the same for all the different um, chord types, right? You could do minor. So that's how I would combat that one. I would just try and see complete scales harmonizing chords, and then I would try to play lines and then harmonize them in chords. Like if I just maybe take G minor as a tonal center, See if I can do that, maybe one in major. And if I can do that and find the chords pretty much as I did then, then that assures me that I've got them well enough underneath my finger. So that's how, we, that's how I would work on um, practicing chord scales. So let's go back to the comments. Lots of comments, thanks for all the comments. It uh, keeps these things exciting, keeps, keeps me going. So let's see what we've got here. Oh, hey, Joe. Thanks for joining in. I hope you're well. Hope you're doing good. Um, Ryan's asked, hey, Jamie, any nice altered scale licks? Thanks for making such great videos. Oh, thanks for the kind words, Ryan. Um, I would just echo what I've said rather than just kind of rehashing anything that I've got on YouTube. Um, if you go onto YouTube and you just type in my name and then you type in altered scale. If I can spell. Altered scale. Then there's a bunch of um, alter scale licks that I did a while ago. So that's what I'd suggest there. Just going on YouTube and learning those rather than rehashing. And of course, that's for anybody that's kind of watching this and interested in all this stuff that's going on. Then uh, that's an alter scale is a really good mode from the melodic minor, which I talked about earlier. So if you want in some kind of just general stuff to practice and some interesting things to do, then working on the uh, melodic minor and altered scale um, they're really good scales to, to work on, used by jazz musicians all the time. So, let's see what else we've got here. So, oh, Joe, you're from Mexico City. That's cool. I've known Joe. Joe's um, 
a cool, uh, great student of mine on, on Patreon. Um, and um, I've got to say, I've got to ham- hold my hand up in confession, Joe. I had no idea. I knew you've, that you were from the US, but um, Mexico City, cool, cool place. I've never been. What's it like? Uh, Ozzy has said, can you please show us some ideas on diminished runs arpeggios over the 5-7? Yeah, for that one. Um, Basically, a lot of these kind of stock kind of ideas that I have, you know, they're just from videos and from teaching concepts that I use all the time. So if you want to learn more about kind of diminished stuff, then if you just type in my name on YouTube and then just type in diminished, um, there's some kind of cool uh, diminished stuff there. I could probably show you uh, maybe I'll show you one thing that I think isn't on there. Um, what was the exact question again, just to make sure that I'm answering it, answering it correctly? Oh, man, I've lost the question. It's not what you want on a live stream, kids. Oh, I found it. So can you please show me some ideas or arpeggios? Um, a, a cool arpeggio concept that I like to use, I'll, I'll give you one is um, this lick. You can take anything that operates from a diminished scale or a diminished arpeggio and just move it up in minor thirds. So... You hear people like Johnny Smith do that all the time and that's one of my favorite ways to use uh, a diminished arpeggio. So there I was just taking one cell and you can mix this up, right? Because it's uh, diminished and it's symmetrical. And then you can get the same thing. Move it up a minor third. And that's one way of doing that. And you can make your own patterns that go up in minor thirds using diminished scales. Of course, the key is to make sure that you resolve them because you asked about doing them, oh, you just said over the five chord, right? So you'd have to make sure that when doing them, you want to you know, practice that with some kind of backing track and make sure you can resolve the idea well. But yeah, I really like using diminished arpeggios and diminished sounds, particularly over minor two fives. I think they have a great sound. And my favorite jazz guitar player that uses diminished arpeggios over minor two fives and major two fives is Johnny Smith, really great jazz guitar player. So Ryan, hello Ryan, you're watching from Hong Kong. Wow, amazing. That must be really late in Hong Kong, right? If it's it's almost 2 p.m. Uh, UK time, so it must be quite late in Hong Kong. And then John, oh, you didn't mean licks. Okay, cool. Um, Jamie, who taught you to play? Good question. <laughs> quite quite a long question, actually. So initially, I started, I, I'm 31, and I started to have lessons, and I began playing when I was 12. So this year, I'm 32 in September, I would have been playing guitar for 20 years, which feels like kind of a long time in one sense but in another sense I just feel like I'm still beginning with the instrument but I used to have guitar lessons initially um, from a few guys that I went to from a few older kind of um, teachers that I went to school with um, who were really good teachers actually they got me reading music and playing chords and playing in bands from a really young age so that was good but in regards to the jazz stuff I went to um, Leeds College of Music which is like a music conservatoire or at least it used to be a conservatoire back when I went and I had some really good jazz uh, jazz teachers there all of them really top-notch players and um, yeah they definitely helped me get going with the jazz stuff and then beyond that just some people that I've met kind of on the scene some people that I played with and picked up things from um, I've, thankfully I've had the opportunity to play with some really good musicians both here in the UK and uh, back in non-COVID times in America as well. And I always used to learn really great things um, just from great musicians. You know, sometimes you'd be hanging out before a recording session or a gig and someone would say, oh, have you ever, you know, come across, um, you know, using this substitute for such and such a song? And they were all kind of like mini lessons that I picked up without even realising it as well. So, yeah, I, I've, I've been fortunate to, um, you know, have lots of kind of experiences that have taught me many things about guitar and jazz. So I guess that's the short answer to who taught me to play. So um, Charles has asked, Hi Jamie, can you explain using modes for soloing instead of playing over the key using... Sorry. Hi Jamie, can you explain using modes for soloing instead of playing over the key, just using key? Instead of playing over the key, just using key. 
not exactly sure what you mean um, by that, but there is a few kind of um, misconceptions about modes that people kind of tend to have. So he's asked about using modes for soloing instead of playing off the key. You know, generally what confuses people there is people think, okay, we're in C major. So if I play um, D minor seven, that, that's just C, right? So why can't I use C for all of the thing and, and just think of a tonic scale? Well, in jazz, what we like to try and do is get more of the sound of each chord. And really, if you think about it, yeah, D Dorian, it's good to know that that is like C major in the sense of it's kind of like there's a C major scale. If I just don't play the first note and start on the second note, that, that gives me D Dorian, but they have completely different sounds, right? A major sound is the Do Re Mi sound, right? <laughs> uh, that's that sound, whereas the Dorian sound. flat free it's a darker sound right so you have to really kind of see these things as different sounds but to begin with like I always say when, when you first start improvising over kind of chords and things like that I always like to think of guy tones so if you are new to improvising over two five ones then learn all the arpeggios in position and then try and do that you know go from the third of each chord and then you can fill that in with some of the scale notes okay so that's kind of like a crash course I probably went over that way too quick but it's a big big subject and I think that most of the time modes are better on modal songs for me I think um, you know if you've got something like impressions or so what then or if you're playing, I don't know, something like Inner Urge and you've got a sharp 11 chord for a number of bars, then that is generally a much better application for, for using modes rather than things like Autumn Beast where you're basically just cycling through a bunch of chords. So, um, some more questions. Let's see what we've got coming in here. So, Jake. So, I'm just going to grab a drink. So Jake says, I love your channel. I'm a guitar teacher from Atlanta and still learn daily from guys like Jamie. Oh, thanks, Jake. That's really kind. I'm glad that you uh, enjoy the lessons. It always surprises me how many guitar teachers watch this stuff as well. A few of my private students on Skype are uh, guitar teachers as well. So it's uh, it's always flattering to know that other guitar teachers are, are watching this stuff. Um, Ryan says, thanks, mate. Daniel Robinson. Hey, Jamie, you might remember me from Corpus. Came across your channel the other day and was very pleased to see it's thriving hope you're doing well yeah of course I remember you Daniel yeah I hope that you're well and uh yeah I, I remember um our jazz jams back at Corpus uh, with fond memories I think that out of all the students that I've taught at school I've been teaching in schools for like five or six years now and uh, there's only been you and one other student in a different school who are like really into jazz I know that the other Daniel at Corpus he kind of likes some of it a little bit but um yeah, so but when you're teaching that many students, if you get one or two that like jazz, you tend not to forget them. But thanks for commenting. What what a, what a surprise to see you on here. Joe has said, it's a big cosmopolitan city. The best analogy I'd have is Los Angeles. I do hope you'll swing through the next couple of years. I'm buying the pints. <laughs> I'll take you up on that, Joe. I'll take you up on that. It's, uh, yeah, that, that's a good offer. I, uh, Hope to get back to doing more gigs in the States. I have some really good memories um, before COVID of playing in the US. Um, luckily, I was fortunate enough to play on a radio show there uh, a number of years ago, which was a really good experience. Um, then Ozzy has said, thanks. JR has said, very nice. Uh, Joe has said, very nice origin story. Um, I'm just going to go through the comments. JR has asked, do you ever play a bebop like Charlie Parker, etc.? Yeah, yeah. Um, big fan of bebop, big fan of uh, Charlie Parker's music. I play quite a few of his tunes in my set. I must 
probably know maybe about 10 Charlie Parker tunes or something like that. I always intend to learn more um, than, than what I do, but big fan of bebop. Um, let's see. Favourite bebop standard? Probably Eternal Triangle by Sunny State. That, that's that's a, a cracking bebop song is that one. If you haven't checked that one out before, Eternal Triangle by Sunny State. Um, and then Wim, I've been playing for 31 years and getting into jazz recently. Well, that's fantastic. You know, you're never too old or never too young to get into jazz. And I think that if you have been playing guitar for a while already, a couple of years, then that's all that's going to give you like a, a good foundation for, um, you know, learning jazz. If you know things like bar chords and basic scales and basic solo, then you should have no problem uh, learning jazz whatsoever. So that's really good to hear. Um, oh, thanks, Joe. Thanks for the kind words. So, just checking in on a few final comments. So, um, I'll be signing off here fairly shortly. So, if you guys have got any last comments, questions, complaints about anything, then feel free um, to let me know. And of course, if any of you guys, um, like I said before, we did some student submissions to kind of get things going here. So, if anybody is interested in getting some feedback off me on their guitar playing, then that's um, a feature I offer to any supporter on my Patreon page. If you're uh, pledging $1 a week, $3 a week, $10 a week, $50 a week, then it, it's all cool with me. I'm just, it's really good for me to know what you guys kind of, how you interpret some of this uh, material and basically what you sound like it helps me make the best lessons possible and deliver the best educational material so and of course if you are a patreon supporter like i know some of you guys are then feel free to send in some videos and i might review these on a future live stream you know i, I found that to be a really good thing to do um excuse me if you do have any videos that you want me to review then or if you intend to make a video try and keep it fairly short if you can kind of keep it like underneath three minutes um if you want to and it can be anything you could play like a solo guitar tune like what i did um at the beginning of the live stream or you could just play over a backing track um and if, if you do any of those things like i said try and keep it fairly short if you're playing over a standard then maybe just play through the melody once and then maybe take one or two choruses of solo in and you might want to take maybe a chorus of comp in. That would be absolutely enough to go by to give me an idea of what level you currently play at. Um, and that's something that has worked really well. Because um, besides doing the things here on Patreon, I also teach uh, some Skype students and Zoom students. And um, whenever they send me videos of airplane, it really helps give me the best, it helps me to give them the best feedback. So, let's see. Any more questions? Just rounding up here. Um, so, Ozzy is saying, bit random, but do you always play sitting down when you play live? I always practice sitting, but if I'm playing live and have to stand, it feels weird because it changes your view of the, the fretboard. That's true. And it, it, yeah, it's a good question. It's something that um, I have thought about before, actually, now that you mentioned it. Because being a jazz guitar player, I do tend to sit down for most of the gigs um, that I play. Um, however, I have done gigs standing up before, but of course I'm one of those totally uncool jazz guitar players. And when I do that, I basically, if I'm standing up with a guitar and I've got a strap on, the guitar is kind of like up here. So I, I'm not going to get any points for looking cool, but um, generally I like to, if I'm going for big chords and things like that, that I like to do, then, you know, having the guitar down to my knees and resting my leg against the monitor doesn't always allow for that. So Although I might look completely uncool, I like to kind of have the strap nice and high so that there's minimal difference. And it does affect, you know, it's, it's a really good kind of general tip actually for any of you that are, that are interested. It's, um, it does actually kind of affect how you play. You know, if you, if you sit here and you play um, like this, I mean, some people never get beyond that and that's fine, but some people play the guitar like this. And, and a good example of someone that does that is Ted Green. For those of you that don't know who he is, he's a fantastic um jazz guitar player telecaster jazz player and uh, you know he would play his guitar like that so he could grab these chords and it, that's how he would play right i don't think he ever stood up but i think it's worth checking out if you, if you currently play it like that maybe you could try classical position and just put the guitar in your legs maybe you could go kind of ted green style and um, hold the guitar like that but that's always a really kind of useful thing to do um just especially if you're going for chords that you can't get because like if you think about say for example um this chord. Now, 
nice nice chord. Chord of the week. <laughs> um, over B flat, you've got B flat, A the seventh, B flat again, then D, which is the third. It's quite hard, my hand feels quite tense in that position. It's kind of doable, you know, sometimes I get it, but if you try that same chord again, but you try it like this, kind of classical position, it's much easier to grab and much easier to do. So that's kind of something um, that's worth checking out. So that was a lot of talk about. That was a long answer to a short question, but hopefully that, that helps you out. So let's see what other questions we've got. Um, I'm learning gypsy jazz guitar player. Have you ever tried the right hand flirting technique? I just don't get it. I'm more of an anchored hand player. I've heard about that, you know, and I'm intrigued by right hand techniques. Um, I think that jo I think that George Benson does. Does he do the right hand flirting technique? It's not something that I've ever tried. Um, to be honest um, with you, so I can't really offer any advice. But I'm sure there's plenty of good gypsy jazz guitar material on YouTube about that kind of technique. But um, I'm not a gypsy jazz guitar player, so I wouldn't want to ill advise you on any <laughs> anything that I have no idea about. So let's move on. So Risa said, any good bossa nova lessons or scales? Any good bossa nova lessons or scales? Well, I have one lesson that I recorded. This should be out early August uh, about Blue Bossa. It's called the Blue Bossa Starter Pack. And that has some kind of like, uh, you know, standard kind of bossa nova comping. So if you subscribe, you'll kind of see that when, when that comes out. Um, but other than that, not really. I, I play and I like a lot of bossa nova tunes, but I, I need to get more lessons kind of um, going on bossa novas. So thanks for the comment. Can you recommend a way to practice triplets? Yeah, I can actually. A really good way to practice triplets. Um, take a scale. Let's maybe take an F major scale. <laughs> If you play, first of all, I mean, I, I have no idea how you play, so I'm kind of making a few <laughs> uh, assumptions. But um, for anybody that's watching that wants to join in on this exercise, then you want to play triplets constantly on one note. So you could go. Now, the next thing you want to do is maybe take that F major scale. start playing it in triplets like that to feel that and then try and play the entire scale in triplets now you'll notice when I played this scale I only go to the high D string right there because of how this fits this will mean that if you're practicing with a metronome you're gonna have a two bar cycle which keeps on looping. So if you practice that going to the seventh for the tonic, which you usually would with a major scale, you're displaced every time. So if you practice a scale in triplets like that, then that's gonna give you like a nice silly grounding to begin with. And you can keep on keep on playing it over and over again, start at a slow tempo, feel it as slow as maybe 80 beats per minute. And then try to increase the tempo. That's a good way in which you can practice triplets. Let's see, any more questions? Um, what tips, exercises do you have moving picking speed, improving picking speed? Um, probably, let me have a think. I 
I would say the one that I just did um, is what is probably a good one for, for doing picking speed that if you do the scale like that in triplets, then that's naturally going to make you do that. Generally working on rhythms, I find is a really good way to improve picking speed. I like to try and get things up to 16th note kind of quality. So, you know, if I'm just practicing standard two octave major scale or whatever, I would like to try and get that kind of going in 16th notes. Um, there's lots of exercises there that are quite well known about. The, the classic example is obviously the... Uh, spider exercise that's a really good one for working on alternate picking right because for doing that I've got constant alternate picking going on so that's one thing you can do if you want a slightly more musical thing to do then a really great challenge um, for jazz guitar picking purposes, uh, bebop tunes, like somebody else was asking me, tunes like Donna Lee. That's naturally gonna kind of force you to do lots of kind of like um, adjacent picking motions. So if you learn a tune like Donna Lee, then you're gonna to have to kind of readjust. If you ask me, I, I think basically technique is, um, it adapts to your playing style, right? It shouldn't be the other way around. Any kind of technique that I've ever um, learned really has come from a need. It's not just because I've kind of like sat down and just thought, well, I'm just gonna sit and practice technique for, for eight hours. If I had to learn something like Donna Lee or Scrapple from the Apple or a solo or a transcription, that's kind of, demanded that I do certain things to improve my technique. So that's kind of what's going on there. So, um, let's see what other questions we've got. Um, should be probably going on too long here. Um, favorite color, favorite color. <laughs> um, probably Sunburst. I like Sunburst. I like Daphne Blue, of course. These are all guitar colors. I, I like that. What I really want is a nice blonde arch top. Is anybody selling a Guild Artist Award or a Guild X500? Preferably blonde. Maybe one from the 80s or 90s. Um, my favorite colors kind of represent <laughs> guitar colors uh, most of the time. Other than that though, I, I like the color teal. teal. Teal is a nice color. Never, never had that question before on a live stream, so, so cheers. Still watch your Josh home vid a lot. That's from the same guy. And Daniel, brilliant. Would love to see you once again, one time to get back into the motivation with guitar because to be honest, I really have the motivation to pick up some guitar. However, when I do those tunes, I oh, that's fantastic. So Daniel was a student of mine at school. What was it? Maybe did you, I think you left 2019, but unfortunately losing the motivation, that's a shame. That's, um, that's not cool, man just listen to, to lots of jazz, maybe try and get playing with some folks again. Um, it's a shame because you're a really good player. I think you had lots of good potential. So it's uh, it's one of those things. Um, I, I feel like uh, basically everything that's happened in the last year, the pandemic stuff, there's been some students of mine that I currently teach, which basically like, you know, that some of them did nothing, you know, over the time I didn't see them and other people kind of really excelled. So it kind of goes one way or another, but yeah, you should keep on going, Dan. Think, think about how far you've come, right? You know all those kind of bebop tunes, you know all the chords. You had a lot of technique and some good ideas. So, so don't give up. Keep on going. So let's see, what, who else have we got here? So David has said, is picking speed exercises different from jazz? Different for jazz from rock to metal? Well, I kind of, you know, like I, some of the ones that I would demonstrate and then bebop tunes, they were, I don't think that so many metal guys play bebop tunes. I could be wrong. Guthrie Govan played Donnelly, didn't he? So um, who's to say? But certainly they kind of, um, that one I think is pretty just kind of a general guitar technique, that one, isn't it? Not really limited to a genre. Tips on practicing in all 12 keys. Um... That's a good question. It depends what context you're talking about practicing in all 12 keys. So for me, it just depends. If it's if it's tunes, 
or if it's scales or I'm not exactly sure what you mean with that. But in regards to what I like to say to people is um, I think it's a really good idea to do progressions in different keys. And what you find, like, I think that that kind of illusion of all 12 keys can sometimes um, sound intimidating to people. But initially, all you've got to do is a couple of different keys that are kind of distant apart from each other and then all the other keys get easy right so just for example autumn leaves um say if we do that in one of the standard keys say b flat then c minor f7 I, I, if you're doing chord progressions i'll just take the chord progression kind of example because that's kind of a good thing to talk about if you want me to do scales or something like that then then let me know but if we're talking about chords then i would think of it like if I was doing autumn leaves, just the A section, I would think of this as being in the key of G minor. So starting with the two, five, one in the relative major. Two, five, one, four, two, five, one, relative minor, then five of two, going back to that. Okay. And that's an easy way to practice tunes. Like you could take that same progression, think of a, 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 tr a more challenging key, something like D flat. And all you've got to think about is the relative minor, which is uh, B flat minor, and then you can go from there, right? So, for example, um, I said D flat, so two, five, one, four, and then minor, two, five, that's the relative minor. And then, of course, you might want to think about the uh, five of the two chord as well. So that's what I would do. I, I would just try and go through... Um, as many different keys like that and you'll find that that is slow at the beginning you're probably gonna have to like write them out and really think about what you're doing but once you get going with one or two keys it kind of has like a snowball effect so that's what I would give for practicing in all 12 keys um, and then Daniel's put the gypsy jazz another Daniel the gypsy jazz picking technique seems counterintuitive to me but they can play faster without resting their hand and playing downstrokes in every string Whereas it makes me slower. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? It, it does seem to work for a lot of people, but um, picking and techniques are really subjective thing on, on guitar. I mean, with my students, I like to suggest certain things, but for example, you know, alternate picking and things of that nature, but check out some videos of Joe Pass, Barney Kessel, some of the classic jazz guitar player. Th those guys all use just a lot of downstrokes, you know, downstrokes for phrasing, unless they're playing fast they would often pick just using down. So I think that it's one of those things where it might be a technique that works for a lot of people. You've always got, just got to find what works for you and do that. Obviously, you know, Wes just uses thumb. Jim Mullen uses his thumb. So that's uh, an interesting point. So um, what Jake said? Do you always think about arpeggios and modes while you are soloing? All of my favourite jazz musicians seem to play by ear. I hear melody in my ear and I chase that melody. That's pretty good. Check. I think that you're onto something with that. I think that if you're playing by ear, then that's good to do. Um, I think that people sometimes have this misconception where they can't separate the kind of the technical aspects of improvising, like scales and modes, with playing. Like, really, when you're playing, when you're playing live, then you want to kind of forget all of that. You know, you, you don't want to be thinking of this mode and such and such here. That's all technique, you know, that, that's all to practice and to get into your, your ears. And that's something that you want to do not on the bandstand, really. So when I am playing, I don't really like to think about scales or modes or anything like that. I like to be in the moment as much as what I can. And I like to basically have an adaptive approach and kind of like you where I've got sounds in my head and I want to try and chase them. Of course, it doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes you, you end up messing things up. But that's the fun and the nature of improvised music is that you're always kind of it's never completely the same. So I think that I do like to, you know, practice some of the technique sides of things, but when I'm improvising, you know, you've got to make that separation between practicing and playing. So that's a really good comment, Jake. And then Ozzy says, Ta, Seb says, it's easier sitting down. Would you recommend the David Baker series on Bebop? I haven't checked it out, Seb. I'm not sure. I, I haven't checked that out. Um, so be interesting to to hear what what you think about that. Seb's a, an old friend of mine um, on here. Always surprises me that the people that watches these videos. There's Seb, there's a Daniel student there, and uh, sometimes some of my uh, private students um, kind of chime in as well. So no, you, you'll have to let me know if they're any good. I've heard of it. I've heard of the David Baker thing. I, th I think it's meant to be pretty good, but I can't comment personally because I haven't personally checked it out. 
Daniel said, some people make modes sound harder than they are. It's easier just to play D minor seven scale, but start from C rather than play Dorian Locrian, if that makes any sense or is right. Yeah, yeah, I think that people make a big deal out of that. I mean, that's a good quick reference for it, but you've also got to lend them as separate sounds also, I think. Jamie, who is the best or most interesting jazz guitar player nowadays, in your opinion? Um, Jake Merritt, check out, check one great video about it by another YouTuber. Okay, um, who is the best or most interesting guitar player nowadays? Good question. I've actually got a video coming out that talks about some of my favourite modern jazz guitar players, but... I think probably the most influential and most innovative jazz guitar player that's come along nowadays is definitely Kurt Rosenwinkel. And I know that Seb uh, will definitely <laughs> agree um, on that one. So I think Kurt is probably the best in, in regards to that. I mean, the, be the best is a strong word, isn't it, for, for jazz? It's not a competition like football. But um, I think Kurt is definitely my favourite. That's probably the better way of doing that. And in terms of innovation and keeping jazz interesting on the guitar if you haven't checked out Kurt Rosenwinkel then check him out you won't be disappointed Ozzy has said what pick do you use Jamie I should be endorsed with these plectrums you know everyone always asks me about these and um I, I'm, I'm just kidding are you hopefully this will focus um, on camera if I switch to this or maybe not maybe it's too close well anyway oh there we go the pick is a Dunlop it's a two mil uh Dunlop pick which is kind of a thick plectrum you know but this is one that um, I've been using for years and years now I do sometimes think that the slightly thinner plectrums have a more articulate sound um, but you get a big sound with, with these kind of thicker plectrums so that's what I use nothing special just kind of cheap uh, affordable plectrums and I've got basically a drawer full of them <laughs> at the side of me here so um Let's see what other people have said. If you listen to all the jazz and transcribe any melody that you're in your head, you can be trying. Yeah, that, that's a really good thing. And that's why I think people, and that, that's what Jake's saying, the idea is if you sing the melody in your mind, you can mechanically map that to the neck immediately if you are truly fluent in that. Yeah, I, I fully believe in, in that kind of um, school of thought, Jake. And that's why I, I always recommend transcribing. It's not just, I mean, you, you get so many benefits from transcribing because you're working on your time, you feel, you can work on lines, you can work on hearing chord progressions. But beyond that, um, what you're really doing is you're hearing something and you're trying to find that sound on your instrument, right? So if you think about improvising yourself, you know, before you even start playing over a groove or something like that, if you've trained your ears, you'll just be able to hear things in your mind and you'll be able to hear ideas to play off. And of course, a good way in which you can do that also is by singing what you play. That's also a really beneficial thing to do. So Daniel says that he has been prioritizing his drum diploma at the minute and also my piano. I still have lessons with them, but not guitar. It's hard to find time for guitar. Well, yeah, I bet if, you, if you're doing a drums diploma and piano, then I wouldn't feel too guilty. Uh, as long as you've got some music in your life, then that's interesting. Daniel was um, he was really great at playing all the instruments. He was the student I've already mentioned. So he could play, I think he did like all these grades in piano, drums. He had a really good drum teacher. Um, and he also did guitar as well. He was a really good guitar player. We were basically kind of touching upon diploma stuff and he was only in year 11. I think he did grade six when he was in year nine or year 10. So I, w I wouldn't feel too guilty, you know, um, but obviously guitar is good. I, I wish I could play a piano as well. I, I could play like a a bit of basic piano but I was saying to my uh, partner the other day like piano as a solo instrument I, I think that that's probably my favorite instrument when it comes to solo performances Dirty Steeds have you ever tried Nin Jam Jamie I haven't tried Nin Jam what is that Jake said, if you can think of words in your heads and see them immediately as a musician, you can hear notes in your head and say them. That's a really great analogy. Yeah, completely on board with that. Good comment. Um, Daniel said, I've never been able to hear much and was put off with the idea of hearing everything. But over years of practice, I've found you can get pretty good without the natural ability. It's just practice. 
Yeah, absolutely true. It really is just practice. Um, trial and error. Um, just keep on going for it. Try to practice and play every day. Occasionally try to play with other musicians and you can't really go wrong um, if you just stick with it. And just remember that learning jazz or learning guitar, it's a marathon. It's not a 100 meter race. If you're in it, you've got to be in it for the long run. So it's uh, <laughs> there is no quick or easy answer. Uh, Daniel's put, I, if you can just hear it, then you don't need to be here, but you definitely can learn it and get by without being a natural ear genius by understanding the rules. Very true. Um, David has put, love Kurt, what about Peter Bernstein? Like him too. Yes, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Peter Bernstein's playing. Got quite a few of his albums and have transcribed one or two of his solos over the years and still stole many of his licks. So, yeah, definitely one of my favourites. I That's the problem. When everyone, whenever anybody asks you to name players, you always end up uh, naming one or two and forgetting the others. But Peter Bernstein is uh, like a really great mix, I think, between like traditional jazz guitar and some of the more modern approaches. Um, so, yeah, definitely a great player to check out. If any of you guys don't know him, check out Peter Bernstein. Um, Sizoid, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, Shizoid, man, has said, how to play outside? Well, to play outside, you get your guitar, you open the door of your house, you go in the garden, and then you play whatever you'd usually play inside, but you play it outside. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't try and be a comedian. That, that was really, really bad. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that was a terrible joke. If you want to know how to play outside, then I just good opportunity to plug another lesson um, and if I share this hopefully you guys can see this one um, to play outside if you just type in my name then outside the second one down should be a useful lesson on playing outside um, really cool concept to explore and one of my favorites um, Jake Miles Davis didn't practice in a classroom all day <laughs> Yeah, he, he definitely did. I probably shouldn't read that out. Um, Daniel, I grew up thinking all these guys were improvising straight from ear when the truth, most people are just playing the pattern scales and licks there. Then. Dirtiest Deeds comes with Reaper, playing with others in real time loops. Check it out. It has been going, oh, cool. That's kind of what we'll do. Then Jake has said, patterns are nothing without an idea in your head. Many of my students know all the patterns cannot improvise as well as other people and don't know the patterns. Einstein always said, imagination is more important than intelligence, yeah. I could tell you're a guitar teacher. You've, you've got some really good ways of translating these ideas. So uh, thanks for checking in and clarifying some things on the chat. It was, it was really good, solid input. So I'm going to round it up there for today, guys. I don't think I've just been kind of on the back end of a bit of a cold, so um, I don't lose my voice again. So thank you all for watching. Of course, if you, you are watching this after the fact and you have any questions about anything that we've talked about then let me know like i said the offer to get feedback on your plane is available to patreon followers so if you're interested in that then you can sign up on the patreon site for as little as one pound or one dollar a week and i look forward to seeing you on there so thanks a lot guys thanks for joining in and uh, i hope to see you next time cheers